My name is Brad, and there's, last year I got to speak here at Q, and there's not a day that goes by that I don't hear from somebody from this community. It's an amazing group of people. So give yourselves a hand, because we're, this is a really special community. I want to thank you. Um, we're going to be talking about staying sparky, and um, I, I'm excited and nervous. I'm nerve-sighted. Uh, this is like a new, everybody from Q has been so nice to me, and so I really felt like we should do something special today. So we're going to kind of go on an adventure together, and I think you're an adventurous group, and you can handle this, yes? Cause, okay, because here's the deal. It's been a weird year, okay? Since the last Q, like, you can't even begin to talk about all the things that have happened from all the celebrities died, to like everybody, everybody online just has lost their minds. Uh, uh, I do this project called Kid President and it's all like uh, about making the world more awesome and, and we posted something just like a couple of months ago and it was, it was like be nice and people lashed out like, what, are you getting political now? <laughs> What has happened to the world? What are you doing? When did that become a political statement? But, so I said, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm gonna leave the internet forever. I'm done. So I left for a few hours and then I came back <laughs> to say, I'm leaving the internet. <laughs> and then I went away and I was like, I miss everybody. And, and, and then, you know what, I found I wasn't alone. There's a lot of people out there just a little bummed out, a little discouraged, and kind of like squinting their eyes to look for hope, kind of squinting to look for some little reminder of good in the world. And so what I've been trying to do is create for myself an oasis that's not hiding from truth or hiding from what's really happening, but that's a group of people who are joy rebels. People who say, yeah, people who say, you know what, this is the way the world is, but here's the way the world could be, and let's give the world a glimpse of that. And so I want to share with you today um, uh, something that has been a, a bit of my journey in being encouraged and being reminded to stay sparky. A lot of my work has been about helping people see the world differently, to see the world like a child does. It's one of the best things you can do is remember what it was like to be a child and to take time to see children and see the way they see things going on. Just the way they see a cardboard box is not just a box with a hole in it, but it's an entry to a whole new world. But this is a room full of brilliant people and I should explain to you first that you're all brilliant and, and I'm only gonna share with you some encouragement to be more brilliant. There's a bunch that I can't do. In fact, I'm gonna just get it out of the way. I can't do math, eat with a fork, athletics, pronounce GIF, GIF correctly, sorry. Organize anything, roll my tongue, work heavy machinery, go somewhere without getting lost, Excel spreadsheets, button my shirts properly, open simple boxes, remember passwords, yoga without laughing, remember if I lock the door, open a talk without saying something embarrassing, or even, can't do it. Uh, <laughs> There's so much I can't do, and I just, it feels good to get that out. It's just there, okay? So, you guys are awesome, and you, you could actually do a lot of these things. But here's what I'm trying to do, and, and, and this is what I'm sharing with you, is that I'm trying to be a better grown-up. And, and I've labeled my life Operation Be a Better Grown-Up. Because I always felt like a kid at the grown-ups table, and then I realized, oh no, I'm a grown-up. I'm the guy in the room. I run a summer camp and all the kids will come up and they're like, hey, what are we gonna do now? And I'm like, I don't know, let me, wait, I'm the grown-up. <laughs> oh no, who, did we order toilet paper? Oh no, like, who's, is staff getting paid? What's going on? Oh no, like, I'm the grown-up in the room. And so I'm trying to be good at it. And it's, it's hard, and it's discouraging. I'm a dad, I love my kids, but, but I'm the grown up in the room, teaching them how to potty. <laughs> I can barely do it myself. 
Look, they're looking at me to show them things. And here I am discouraged and beat down and feeling weird about my own self. I don't know if you feel the same way, but I think it's time to be a better grown-up. So in doing so, I've been looking at better grown-ups. Who are some people that embody what that means, what that looks like? One of those for me, and I do fan art of them, but one of those for me is, is Jim Henson, and, and I think about the impact he had on me as a kid, and, and opening up my eyes to imagination. And this is a quote I love of his, that the most sophisticated people I know inside, they're all children. And I've kept this quote in my pocket for a lot, a lot of times. If I go somewhere and I know I'm going to be like nervous about all the fancy people in a boardroom or it's a bunch of people, it helps me remember, hey, they're all children too. At some point, we were all children. But we forget it. So that's what we're going to explore today in Stay and Sparky. But in doing this, I, I'm kind of walking a tightrope because I, I, want, I want to share with you a story. And, and I'm just nerve-sided about sharing it because this is a personal story. It's about my daughter, but it's also not about her. It's about a girl that can float, the incredible floating girl. So it's in three parts. So we'll show part of it now and then in the middle and then there at the end. So here we go. And this is the story of the incredible floating girl. And, and because you're cute, they're the first human beings in the world to hear it. So here, here we go. Okay. All right. Well. Here it goes. The uh, story of the incredible floating girl. Here we go. Uh, part one, taking flight. May I share with you a story? It's wild and it is true. I must share with you a story about a girl. Some say, well, flew. Do you know the story? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. It's about a girl, a girl who could float. It didn't really make the papers. In fact, they tried to keep it from their neighbors, but I promise you it is true. She was just a few months old. <laughs> she was just a few months old as her father was putting her to bed. When laughing, up she went, up, 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 and on the ceiling, she hit her head. He found a way to bring her down, but was still in disbelief. He tried to tell his wife, but she said, honey, you need some sleep. <laughs> but sure enough, it happened again. And the father said, see, every time I come near the girl, she loses her gravity. Smiling wide and laughing loud, up, 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 she would go. And there he would be terrified, standing down below. <laughs> I'll catch you. I will catch you. Please get down here, he would cry. But she only floated higher when her father would come by. Now, floating ran in their family as far back as they could go. And floating runs in many families, but it's not something you can really know. You see, floating is very strange, and Q, I'm quite sad here to admit, floating is something that you grow up and soon forget. Operation Be a Better Grown-Up, um, I, I, I've been creating things for a long time that were used in classrooms, but then I, I did this little project just as a one-off fun thing with my brother-in-law who lives across the street, and it's called Kid President, and the idea was just to put an image in the world, thank you, uh, put an image in the world of a boy who cares about stuff, because I felt like that was important. And then it turned into this movement. And it's really fun for he and I to make these things together. And uh, he's a blast to be with, and I adore him. Um, but it led to our videos being seen by now close to a billion people. And um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and I'll scratch my head a lot trying to figure out why and how and what. And what is it that, that is the impact? And, and, did I, is it because the color of the set? Is it because of the suit? Is it because of him? Is it because of some magic I don't understand? Is it because they're positive? Or is it simply because there's this hunger we all have to pause and remember what it was like to be a child? To see the world in a more innocent way, in a more imaginative way. And I, I, I think when I talk about being more like a kid, I hope you know I don't mean childish, because as we know, the world is plenty childish. Instead, being childlike 
That's what we're after. And being childlike requires you to see the world in, in a couple of ways. Kids are on a constant quest for three things. Wisdom, wonder, and whimsy. Like, that's it. That's what they're in search of. That's what they want. That's their, like, their, their, their journey every day is about questing for those things. So wisdom, they want to know, what is this place I'm in? Who are you? What is this? What is going to kill me next? Will this make my mom mad? I don't know. Like, all those things, this wisdom they're wanting to know, like, about the world. And then wonder. Then when they find out about it, it's like, whoa and seeing things for the first time, and their eyes lighting up. Wow. My kids are in the grocery store, and it was just a normal day. They were just going to the grocery store, but no, they saw something. And they, they, they froze. They were frozen so long my wife could take pictures, and several pictures, and she sent it to me. She's like, what do you think Miles and Matilda are looking at? Here's another picture. <laughs> what do you think it is that's captured their attention, their imaginations? What has their eyes so full of wonder? I mean, look at them. They're just, wow. What is that? Oh, what is it? What do I see? What has captured them? What has got them? This. <laughs> this. What? <laughs> that? Made that happen. <laughs> and even just recently, my kids saw this video again. They saw themselves and saw that. And my daughter went, wow. <laughs> what? <laughs> and, and, but I, I think there's something to seeing things with a child's eyes. Rachel Carson is this brilliant, oh, she's this brilliant. She said so many things about our environment and, and saw the world with such wonder. She actually wrote a book called A Sense of Wonder in which she talks about being out in nature with her young nephew, Roger. And she says, if a child is to keep alive his inborn sense of wonder, he needs the companionship of at least one adult who can share it, rediscovering with him the joy, excitement, and mystery of the world we live in. And Rachel Carson knew something about needing a grown-up. Because if you read about her life, it all goes back to people who helped point her to wonder. For her, it goes back to Mary Scott Skinker, who saw her and saw in her so many things that she could write and that she was a scientist and that she could actually unlock things in the world that people needed to know. And it all goes back to her. And then I began to wonder about other people, like other people I love, whose voices have had a big part in my life. And you look at Maya Angelou, whose voice has been vital and meant so much to, I'm sure, many of you, but in, in women's rights and civil rights and so many things. And for her, it all goes back to a neighbor slash teacher named Mrs. Flowers. And even just, if you could, there's a, a couple of interviews with her just before Maya Angelou passed, and she was still talking about Mrs. Flowers. There was a lady who took her to the library when she was young and said, read every book. And, and then that was there where Maya Angelou discovers poetry. She also discovered her voice. She spent a good part of her adolescence mute. And thank goodness for Mrs. Flowers who walked alongside her to help her find her voice. And then Tom Brokaw, who's this amazing, like, this famous, well-respected newscaster, this, this anchor of news, this teller of stories, and over and over and over, he talks about Mrs. Morrow, a lady who made him read above his grade level, who said he was thinking small, and he told him to use his imagination. And he talks about her all the time. And then there's Oprah, who had nobody. She just was Oprah. Nope. For her, it was her staff surprised her with her fourth grade teacher. In 1989, her staff surprises her, and all she does the whole segment is cry. She couldn't get through it. She's crying the whole time. And then what's really great is, okay, imagine Oprah, you're Oprah's teacher, okay? Oprah's teacher didn't really remember her. <laughs> <laughs> Here's this person that had such an impact on Oprah Winfrey, Brad, 
like all that stuff. And, and the teacher's kind of like, Oprah goes, is in, in tears in the clip. She's like, so what was I like as a little girl? And she's like, oh, I mean, you know, you, you were just, you know, you were nice. You were, uh, whatever. I, she's like, no. She wasn't like, oh, you were Oprah. You had it. She was like, I don't know. But isn't that incredible that you can have such an impact on somebody and have a no idea? We have a sign in our workshop that says, be who you needed when you're younger. Because that has guided everything I've done that has clicked and worked and made it. It's because I'm thinking back to who was it that I needed when I was a kid? And I want to be that. So I'm trying to be that more. And I don't know what you needed when you were younger, but there was somebody who was there somehow. And maybe right now you're a reflection of that person who you needed when you were younger. Or maybe you are a reaction to what you didn't have when you were younger. Either way, you can be who you needed. It's a thing that kids need heroes, right? That, that, that we instantly kind of pick out people and we say, that, that's me. That's who I want to be. For me, my, one of my heroes was this guy. <laughs> oh, I, I can find a better picture. Uh, Okay, maybe not, maybe not. Uh, this was my camp counselor, okay? Like, I showed up to summer camp, and here he is. His name's Matt Atnip. And there was this guy who was the funniest human being I had ever seen in real life. And there he was. And he was the coolest human being I'd ever seen in real life. He got these shirts he got from a thrift store that belonged, like, it had a gas station, like, purse. He wore those and cut off the sleeves. I was like, whoa, he doesn't even need sleeves. <laughs> this is my kind of guy. I went home and everything. I was like, well, what would, how would he do it? What would he do? You know what's even cooler about him? Like, not only was he the funniest, coolest guy ever, he knew my name. Me. Sometimes I had to remind him, but he knew it. <laughs> he was my hero. Now, I didn't have posters of Michael Jordan or posters of, like, any other celebrities. If, I could, if there was a poster of this camp counselor, I would have had it. Uh, this is another picture of him. <laughs> and, you know, for, there's other people who had heroes, too. I don't know who that was for you, but for Mozart, even Mozart had a guy that was that guy. Uh, for Mozart, it was uh, Haydn. And you can hear this music now playing. This is music that was composed by Mozart when he was just a teenager. And he composed this inspired by listening to Haydn. He listens to him and he's like, that guy is doing it. I want to make things that make people feel the way he made me feel. So he goes and he composes these pieces as a teenager. It's basically fan art. And when he releases it, you know what? It's heard by this hero. There's even years later, you fast forward, and Haydn walks alongside Mozart and helps him along the way and sees talent in him. And Mozart and his father were fairly close and competitive, and there's lots of crazy stories there. But there was a point where Mozart and his father weren't on good terms. And he wasn't excited about where Wolfgang was going with his music or what he was doing. And it sort of said, you're not the son I thought you were. And they're at an event, and Haydn's there. They're standing in the back. Wolfgang's at the piano. And Haydn is said to have leaned over to Mozart's dad and said, you do know this kid is a miracle. And that's it. Wolfgang and his dad got back together, and they were better. But I think about all those teachers who have kids that you see that are remarkable and the parents maybe just start seeing it and you've leaned over and just prodded them and reminded them, you know, this kid is a miracle. He was inspired to make this music. I don't know who it was for you, but somebody was there for you when you needed it when you were younger. Maybe they walked alongside you, or maybe they did something that sparked greatness in you, that invited you to dream bigger, to do better, to be who you are now. If you have a notebook, I hope you'd write their name down, or in your phone, make a note. 
to thank them. I want to read, uh, we've been doing this project called I Am Blank Because You Were Blank. And it's been inviting people to finish this sentence. I am this because you were this. In a world where like online and in the world, it seems like we're so divided and there's so many things tearing us apart and saying how we're different, and yet we're so connected. We're so connected in what we do for each other. So we ask people to do this, and if you want to get one for your class, you can go to becauseyouwere.com and you can download a thing. We're creating a patchwork of all these stories. We've been getting them from all over, people saying, I'm not afraid because you were willing to channel my energy to the stage. That's to his teacher. I am successful because you were supportive, creative, committed, and dedicated. I am stronger because you were everything I didn't know I needed. I am a guy who draws for uh, colors for a living because you encouraged me to follow my gifts even when you didn't understand. Entire schools have been doing this, and it's been beautiful to see people f fill their, their piece of paper with gratitude for someone and then share that story. Back to, this, back to this story. Oh, no. Okay, here we go. The Incredible Floating Girl, part two. Though nerve-wracking for her father, it was beautiful to see a graceful, smiling girl gliding free as a girl could be. Quiet places were discovered where she could go and fly outside, and her father would watch her from below with feelings of great pride. She would soar, she would soar as free as could be and wave at her father, hoping that he could see. But as the girl grew older, the pressure, it grew too. And slowly something happened. Less and less it was, she flew. Little by little, day by day, the whole problem of floating had floated away. For so many years this had been such a stress, but now no more worrying, now his daughter floated less. By the end of elementary school, the floating completely ceased. By the end of junior high, it felt like it had all just been a dream. High school and college ended and the daughter moved far away. She took a job and she grew up like many hoped she'd do one day. And now none of the family could remember or say exactly what had happened. Had the floating they'd known been real or something they'd all completely imagined? But every now and then, be it something she saw or felt or heard, the daughter's heart would skip a beat when she looked up and saw a bird. Why these things would happen, she thought it just a fluke. But somewhere not too far away, her father would feel it too. There's something that happens. This is the Thoreau quote that I've, I've found that is fascinating to me. The youth gets together his materials to build a bridge to the moon, or perchance a palace or temple on the earth, and at length the middle-aged man concludes to build a woodshed with them. <laughs> like, so to recap, youth wants to build a moon bridge, old dude's woodshed. <laughs> like, <laughs> but there's something that happens. Like, why does that happen? This youthful enthusiasm just goes, pfft. It's like, yeah, moon bridge. Yeah, let's just build a shed. Like, what is that? What happens? It's because we, we get beat down. We need pep talks. I write pep talks because I need pep talks. And it, it was a few years back, I really needed a pep talk. So I put it on a little note card, and then I threw it away because I thought, no, this is too personal. This is too hard on the sleeve. I'm not going to do it. And this is the actual card of the original notes. And, and you'll see there's a lot of lines that weren't used because they're not very good. But some of them were. We made a video. We put it online. And within a few days, I found out I wasn't alone. There were lots of other people who needed a lift. There were lots of other people who needed somebody to, to, to some bit of encouragement. I found out I was not alone. In fact, there were millions of people, and now over 39 million people, almost 40 million people, have seen this video, this pep talk. And I am scratching my head still as to how and why this happened. 
And in that video, yeah, okay. In that video, <laughs> in that video, there's this like really motivational line about what if Michael Jordan had quit. You know, there's this story about Michael Jordan. He almost didn't make the team in high school and all. Here we go. Here's a clip. Will Michael Jordan have quit? Well, he did quit. Oh, he retired. Yeah, that's he retired. But before that, in high school, what if he quit when he didn't make the team? He would have never made Space Jam. What will be your space jam? What will you create will make the world awesome? Nothing if you keep sitting there. That's why I'm talking to you today. This is your time. This is my time. It's our time. Yeah! Yeah! So what will be your space jam? You know, what will be your space jam? What will you create to make the world more awesome? Yeah! Like I was... This is something I want to put out into the world and get everybody riled up. And did like 39 million people saw it. And then you know what else? I made some more videos. Not as many people watched them. <laughs> oh no. I made my Space Jam. Oh no. I should die now. <laughs> Nobody cares. I made the thing I came here to do. <laughs> I'm done. And I began to feel that. I began to feel like, oh, okay, like I'm not good anymore. Uh, I'm just the guy who likes, writes these videos and, and everybody watched one of them, but I made other ones I'm more proud of, but nobody cared, not even my mom. <laughs> oh, dear. And then I would do cool things in the community. Like we did this project where we got... Microsoft to send a bunch of laptops to uh, uh, these, these Surface Pros uh, to their school in our community. It was really amazing. We worked super hard on it. It made the front page of the newspaper. Uh, there I am. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, it's like, well, that's not, you know, whatever. That's a good picture. And, 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 but they spelled my name wrong, like, even in the thing. And I was like, oh, no. I'm disappearing, little by little. I don't matter to humanity. I got invited to the United Nations, and, and, and I made this video, this film that was shown, that's all about like their mission, and it's being shown at the United Nations, and they said, we want you to like, come, come speak and, and, and present this film that you've made, and I was like, well, I'm back. And, and I go to the UN, and they're ready to show the film. I go backstage, and they said, oh, you're supposed to, I'm so sorry, we forgot. My whole family, we flew out. They're in the audience, and then I like come back, and I'm like, uh, they, they forgot. And we just went home. <laughs> That's it. Didn't post that on social media. No. Do you know what everybody saw? Hey guys, I went to the UN. <laughs> they invited me. They forgot that they invited me, but whatever. Oh, what is happening? I'm dying. I already made my Space Jam. See you guys. Then we went on The View, though. This is, we went on The View. This is cool. I don't know if you're aware of this, but we have been trying to get you on our show for, for several years now. And I, I'm so happy you could join us. Did you see me? It's this here. <laughs> and I had made this whole big thing with the producers about, I can't wait to meet Whoopi. Like, I love Whoopi. And they're like, oh, this is going to be great. She's going to love you. And they're like... <laughs> My mom, so she was watching, and she's like, I didn't see you. I'm like, I, yeah, did you DVR it? You can rewind this part. There I am. And, and I, I got I, I, this, you guys are friends, I can tell you this, right? I, I got a, a, a little discouraged, and, and because I didn't get to meet Whoopi Goldberg. But it wasn't about that. I, I didn't start all this to meet Whoopi Goldberg. What, why in the world was I so hurt? I, um. What will be your space jam? Oh, what no. Will you and the whole time, off? this what was ringing in my ears. What will be your space jam? What will be your space jam? Space jam. 
a nightmare <laughs> what will be your space jam. We got invited to a dinner. And it was a dinner, one of those fancy ones that are terrible. <laughs> the ones that have name plates where you're supposed to sit in a certain place and put your fork somewhere and, and, uh, and everybody's asking you the question, so what do you do? <laughs> uh, well, I make silly videos on the internet. <laughs> and, uh, well, I used to, like, I made one that was really great. And uh, but that was my space jam. <laughs> so I had to sit by somebody, and it was Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor. <laughs> <laughs> and she wasn't there yet, and I sat down. I was like, oh, who's, who's sitting there? I know her. I got on like my phone. I'm like, that, is that, that's, that is Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor. I'm like, no, she's gonna ask me what I do, and I, <laughs> I know what she does. She's just doing amazing stuff. Oh no. And she sits down, and of all the people I've met, she is one of the most remarkable human beings. She's like this this motherly figure, this bright light. She sits down and she's so generous and kind. And she asks, then and she's, we're, we're just having general conversation, but then it happens. And I'm like, oh no. She's like, so Brad. Oh dear. She says, what do you love about what you do? She got me. <laughs> I could answer that. I immediately, like, it came out of me. I didn't even realize I had answers to that. It was, what do I love about what I do? I love kids. I love seeing them light up. I love people who are former kids and seeing them fall in love with the kid they used to be and the grown-up they could be. I love seeing good happen in the world. I love seeing people go from cynicism to complete joy. I love being able to create things and make things. I love that. I love it. Oh no, I answered your question. I make silly videos on YouTube. <laughs> she asked everybody that question. She even asked Robbie, and a lot of people ask him questions and treat him like an internet meme. She treated him like a human boy. She asked, what do you love about what you do? And his response was, I like hanging out with Brad. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I, I'll take that. I'll take that. I asked her why she asked that question. I said, I heard you all night asking this question, what do you love about what you do? And she said, well, I, you know, I go to these things. I don't like saying I'm Supreme Court Justice. You know, <laughs> she said, I like being able to tell people I help people. I help give people a voice. I like listening and letting people know their voices matter. And, 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 and she said, if you ask somebody what they do, you get a noun. But you ask somebody what they love, and you get adjectives. And you find out who somebody really is when you know what they love. So I ask you, what do you love about what you do? My camp counselor, he stayed with me. He loved me before it made sense, and he's still stuck by my side. We had these crazy videos go viral, and our phone's going off the hook, and I'm just stressed out. And, and I, I go back to conversations with him. He was this constant source of calm in the storm. Before anything crazy had happened, and we had just started doing the videos, he had me write down why I was doing this and keep it by my laptop. And I did that, and that's what helped keep me through. It was his guidance, still, he's still there. Even now, he, like, he listens to every podcast I do, every interview, he watches everything, and I don't understand why. He's the cool one. He's the funniest human you could ever meet. Like he's, he should be on the stage right now. He points people to love all the time. He is the best dad. He's this guy. He's my, but he still takes time for me. It reminds me what I love about what I do. I um, began to realize I didn't start all this for applause or start all this to go viral or to meet Whoopi Goldberg. But it was all a love mission. It all was, was because 
I'm fueled by love and want to share love and, and to be reminded that I, I didn't create my Space Jam already. My Space Jam isn't a thing I make. Your Space Jam isn't an accomplishment or a trophy or some reward or something you make. Your Space Jam is your life. Your best work won't be seen by 39 million people. And I'm not saying that because you won't do something amazing. You won't like build a rocket that sends kids to Mars or you won't do something remarkable because somebody in this room will. I'm saying that even if you did that, your best work is still that face-to-face -face interaction with the people right next to you. And even though I've had things that have been seen by millions of people, the best work is the relationships with the people right next to me. That is your Space Jam. And that is a masterpiece of a life. This is so nice. Uh. So um, this is uh, a, an incredible uh, work of art by Verruccio. And I probably said that totally wrong, and apologies, Verruccio. But this was the final thing he created. And so many people said, this is his master work. This is the thing he will be remembered for. This piece here. He died just after finishing it, and it wasn't even able to be placed in, in Venice where it still is now. There were people who looked at it and said, the movement in this transcends anything that has ever been done in sculpture. This work shows the possibility of art into the new dawn. People were moved by this work. Even though it's an impressive piece, I don't think he would say that's his greatest work of art. Or this one. Or this one. He had a nickname that was given to him that was called True Eyes. He had this ability to see things other people didn't see that actually were there. In fact, it wasn't just in a marble that he was sculpting or in a paint painting that he was working on, but it was in these people. Because at his shop, he had these apprentices. And his apprentices would go on to surpass him, including one which was this guy. He would say, my best work is not that man on a horse. It's unlocking these artists who have helped shape our world. That is a masterpiece of a life. In a time where we really need hope, we need to live masterpieces of life. And I've been talking about this, and then do you know who called? The Guggenheim. The, the Guggenheim, and they let me come speak at the Guggenheim. And so I knew I was going to be going to the Guggenheim, so I said, well, let's steal something. Because <laughs> like, in movies, they always steal art from museums. And I was like, this is going like a heist. So my wife and I, I just kept trying to get her excited about stealing art from the Guggenheim. I was like, this is going to be incredible. I mean, sure, an alarm will go off, but I mean, I'm kind of fast. <laughs> we can do this. I wear a big coat, and even if I don't, it'll make a great story for the grandkids. But, but then I, I, was, I didn't want to go to jail and, or pay fines, and I realized that what if we smuggled art into the museum? And what if it was kids' art about in, in, in this world that, that needs hope? What if we had kids tell us what they think hope looks like? And they did it. In fact, some of your students did that. I met some of you. Yes! They, so we crafted a plan to get into secret parts of the museum. I had a coat. My wife had a giant overcoat. We snuck all the pieces in our coat, even in my pants. <laughs> that was the thing. And we had this briefcase and everything, and we go into the, the Guggenheim. And kids came together, as they do, where classrooms said, we're going to show you what hope looks like. Some kids had their, all, their hands all in together, working as a team to show us what hope looks like. Some of the kids, this is a young boy who's not very verbal, and yet he depicted hope as his home and his family, and this is a self-portrait he did. Many kids for hope is heroes. They depicted lots of superheroes. We got over 500 pieces. We packed as many as we could in our suitcase. Some didn't fit. Some were better than others. But we were determined to show every single child's piece at the Guggenheim. Because how cool would it be to be able to forever say, 
yeah, my, my work has been shown at the Guggenheim. <laughs> it's going to be the best. So we take it in. And one boy who, um, he wrote a poem about being different. So I had that blown up and then held it up at the Guggenheim and displayed that. We showed that to people. And it's called I Am Odd. And if you've not heard Benjamin's poem, you can look that up online. Um, this is a girl who created her own superhero who erases negativity. So of course, she, we've got to show her work at the Guggenheim. And, and I was tear. you can't see my face in them because I'm crying. Because this girl, it's her work at the Guggenheim. Now I know there's a school here. This is your students. Many of your students from this school here are refugees. They've moved here to this country. They're navigating not only being a child, but being a child in a new country. For a lot of kids, hope was rainbows and cupcakes, but for these kids, hope was so much bigger. Hope was everybody safe together in one place. Hope was dreams about their future for their family and what they could do, what they could be. And, and there was such power in those pieces. The Guggenheim even, like, we ended up not getting in trouble. And they even let us create a little wall. And these kids, their work actually got to be put up for people to see. And to see people interact with that art was unbelievable. Tears, laughter, confusion. <laughs> but hope does that. Hope makes us cry and laugh and confuses us. It was from all over the world. Hope, hope from all over the world. I hope I can fix this. Hope is us all together. Hope is bright colors. Hope is these people that I love. Hope is us like physically coming together to spell it out. Um, this is so cute. <laughs> okay, trade out the H, all right. Um, but there was this piece, and I totally missed it, as I do sometimes. The most important things I totally miss. And it was this piece that said, hope is where we are. A young boy did this. My wife saw it. I was like, look, we're in the museum here trying to smuggle in hope. <laughs> and here's this boy's art. It said, hope is where we are. And I know that it can feel dark and it can feel hopeless. It can feel like things are going crazy all around you. But when things are going crazy, you just love like crazy. And so hope is not something you're having to smuggle into your hallways or classrooms. Hope is not something you're having to stuff in and be like, okay, I'm going to like do. Hope is right where you are. In fact, for a lot of kids... When they see you, they don't see a teacher or, or a, a, an adult who's going to like tell them what to do. They don't see you. They see hope. Hope is where you are. This is not just a room full of teachers, but a room full of hope. Because hope is right under your feet. It's every single place you go. This is um, an interesting chart from Stratosphere, a book by Michael... Um, uh, full on about the loss of student enthusiasm for school by grade level. And there's a lot of uh, different things. He did like a study of 2,000 students. And, and uh, I think there's probably a lot of factors at play here. There's probably a lot of stories. But I think we've probably seen that in our students. And it probably has less to do with school than everything else going on around them and inside them. And I'm sure that's not just students, but maybe you in your career, or where you're at, that enthusiasm that, that is going. The Little Prince is one of my favorite books, and yes, and, and he, he wrote a lot of books, and one was a travel journal where about him flying and uh, the wind, the sand, and the stars, and in the back of that book, he writes about being on a train in France, and, and it was this area that had, had been struggling with war and poverty and these people and economic uncertainty. They're here in this train, and he sees them, and he sees a child with them. And, and he writes about this child, and he says, what, did it, what discourages me is not the poverty around us, but the ch forgotten children around us and within us. 
And he looks at one child in particular and sees his family just sitting there and he, he describes them as being almost non-human, empty, and broken. And he weeps for that child and says, there is a gardener for plants, but not for men. What could this child not become and under different circumstances? And he describes that this child could be Mozart. But in his words, he writes, we are murdering Mozart. And he lives in a society that is murdering Mozart. What could not this child become? I'm thankful to be in a room full of people that see potential in every child, that ask this question constantly. And it's because there was somebody who asked that of you. A rock pile ceases to be a rock pile the moment a single man contemplates it, bearing within him the image of a cathedral. May you see your students as these masterpieces in the making, as works of art and works in progress. May you see them as both. But I want to say this to you. You are cathedrals. You are masterpieces. You are walking works of art that inspire other people to be masterpieces as well. We'll go to our final part of the story. <clears throat> part three of The Incredible Floating Girl. <sighs> so, part three is finding what well, is already there. Life moved along as life is known to do. So much had been forgotten, so much they all once knew. But you're never too distant, no, you're never too far to come back and remember who we really, truly are. Her father was stuck as he tried to make his way through traffic to make it to see her that day. He rushed best he could, going over every speed limit because his grandson would be arriving precisely any minute. Though time had divided them, today there was joy. Today his daughter would give birth to a beautiful baby boy. This new mother looked on her baby and did so lovingly, and yet saw something the girl never ever dreamed she would see. How in the world? I could never even think it. A baby floating happily with a floating baby blanket? The daughter, a new mother, was shaking in disbelief. And in that moment, yes, that moment, she remembered everything. She remembered the floating, the soaring, and the flying. She remembered the lightness, the laughing, the stopping, the crying. She remembered the thrill of soaring over the water. But most of all, yes, most of all, she remembered her father. And it was there in that instant, it was there that she knew him. It was him. He's the reason I flew. Maybe a magical connection or some other surprise, but something in his presence always helped her to rise. She remembered him standing with eyes full of care. Never did she fly unless her father was there. Here she remembered all the magic she once knew, standing like her father with a child floating too. The door slowly opened, and friends, I'm telling you, just as it did, the daughter looked to see her father, and he looked to see her slippers slowly lift. May we all have days to remember the magic we've once known, and never forget we need each other because no person flies alone. Should your spark begin to fade because of stress or time or fear, you'll need reminding of your flying and the reasons we are here to fly and help each other fly. It's wild and it is true, to fly and help each other fly. It's what we're here to do. <clears throat> mm. 
uh, Da Vinci said, once you have tasted flight, you will forever walk the earth with your eyes turned skyward, for there you have been, and there you will always long to return. I don't know who it was for you, who helped guide you in your life. I don't know what that is, but the explorers most capable have a compass unbreakable. And there's people around us who help point us into true north. Jane Goodall is one of our final better grown-ups. This person has done beautiful things for the environment and pointing people towards loving animals and seeing them in a new way. When she was a young girl, she was so fascinated with the chickens that she would go and try to figure out where are those eggs coming from? <laughs> and she got so thrilled by being there that she wanted so badly to find out. And there was one little chicken, one, one, one bird that she could get near that wouldn't run away. And so she followed it and she snuck into the barn and she got right there with it and she watched and she saw it take care of its nest. She saw it struggle, she saw it make these noises. She saw it calmly lift up and there be an egg. She was so mesmerized by it, she ran out of the barn, not realizing that she had been missing for over four hours. And she was just four years old. And she runs out. She was so excited to say what she had seen. And her mom could have done a couple of things. She could have immediately said, where have you been? We've had a search and rescue and you have done everything. But instead, Jane Goodall writes in her autobiography that her mother, she says this, she, she noticed my shining eyes. She saw those shining eyes and she calmed down and said, tell me what you saw. This is a book that I love. And I love it because my wife introduced it to me. I love Roald Dahl, but I'd never read Danny, the Champion of the World. And she, when we were dating, she's like, you need to read this book. And I did, and I fell head over heels for it. And then, do you know what? Uh, uh, Roald Dahl is just brilliant, writes lots of stories. Uh, I, he's always been an inspiration, but this book was a special copy given to me by um, there's, a, there's a part at the end of the book where it says, Roald Dahl has a note that says, what a child wants and deserves is a parent who is sparky. I've loved that. A sparky parent. And, and if you read this, the father has some great advice on seeing it's in your eyes. The sparkiness. But this book was given to me by this guy. <laughs> it was just before my son was born. And there's a line in the book, and it's in chapter two, where he's talking, to his, talking about his dad. And he writes, my father, without the slightest doubt, was the most marvelous and exciting father any boy ever had. And he added a note, until now. Aww. And then he put a note that said, stay sparky. I read this this year, that copy, with my son. We're reading it together. And I'm a, just a mess reading the note from his Uncle Matt. And he's like, what's going on? I'm like, I don't know. But just, I'm trying. I'm vowing. I'm telling you, buddy, I don't know how or if I can pull it off. But I want to stay sparky for you. I want to live up to this. There's somebody who, who believed in you before it made sense. Let them know you're trying to live up to it. And there's somebody who's looking at you and they don't see a person. They see hope. Stay there. If you want to stay sparky, what a child wants and deserves is a parent who is sparky, a teacher who is sparky, any sort of grown-up presence that is sparky. If you want to stay sparky, keep showing up. Keep helping them rise up and repeat. Keep showing up, keep helping them rise up and repeat. Keep showing up, keep helping them rise up and repeat. Because should your spark begin to fade because of stress or time or fear, you'll need reminding of your flying and the reason we are here. To fly and help each other fly, it's wild and it's true. To fly and help each other fly, it's what we're here to do. May you find wisdom, wonder, and whimsy in every step of the way. And thank you for letting me be with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay sparky. <laughs>